in terms of classifying semi-simple cohomological field theory is in terms of a topological field theory in this R matrix action. So I want to first define given tall's R matrix action on logical field theories and then use that to actually write down a family of tautological relations on MGN bar extending the faber zagier relations. So start with given tolls R matrix action. So the situation here is that we start with a logical field theory omega, and remember there's various data that this consists of. You have classes omega gn, you have a vector space v, you have a metric on the vector space, you have a unit element. It gives rise to more structure, such as the quantum multiplication on v. So say if we are given such a cohomological field theory, and then a matrix R. So R should be, should have leading term one, and then it's a power series in some formal variable Z over the vector space V. Possibly, to be careful, I should be extending things to, to complex numbers or something, but. power series in Z. So this matrix R has to satisfy a single condition, symplectic condition. So <coughs> write R of Z times R star of minus Z should be equal to one, the identity matrix where R star is adjoint with respect to the metric. So that's the starting data, and then given those R matrix actions should be a new cohomological field theory. New cohomological field theory R omega. Again, that means a, a class for every G and N inside cohomology of MGN bar tensored with N copies of the same vector space V. The other data will be the same. Let's write it again. All right, so the way in which this will be defined is a graph sum. Tell you what you get when you um, pick G and N, and then pick N vectors V1 through Vn to feed to it to get an actual cohomology class on MGN bar. And a big sum over gamma stable graph, one over automorphism group of gamma iota gamma star remember this is the gluing map corresponding to gamma gluing together a bunch of mgv nv bars but i now need to tell you what to put inside here A product over vertices, but then for each vertex, I want to take a sum over non negative integers k sub v. Divide by factorial of k sub v. So k sub v is going to be a number of sort of 
virtual marked points which are added in. So what's, what I'm going to write here is pi star push forward along pi of something, where pi here I'm e just using as notation for some forgetful map, which is going to be from mgv nv plus kv bar to m bar gv nv. Forgetting about the last case of v points. So we choose, for each vertex, we choose some number of additional marked points. I'm going to tell you a class on mgvnv plus kv bar, and then going to push forward and divide by kv factorial. And that's going to be the contribution vertex v. You then piece those all together using the data of the stable graph gamma. Well, what I put here, I should at some point be making use of well, both pieces of data here, the homological field theory and the R matrix. So here I'm going to put, um, maybe I'll just write it for now as omega GV NV plus KV. Then I need to tell you some, some vectors to feed to it. But I'll, I'll do that separately in a picture. This is the shape of the formula for given tolls R matrix action. To sum over graphs, where at each vertex, you essentially put the cohomological field there you start with. So R doesn't appear here, and I also haven't told you exactly what you, what NV plus KV vectors you feed to um, omega. So the picture, do have enough room. But let's think about this in the case where so over here, I'll be thinking about the case where gamma is very simple graph. Say it has two vertices, a single edge. I mean, I haven't told you how R um, interacts. In the case where R is... Yeah, you, you, you will be able to, to observe that from the formula. Um, and more or less what will happen is that there will be edge terms, vertex, uh, there will be edge factors, vertex factors, and leg, le, and leg factors, and if R is one, then the edge factors will vanish. Which means if you have one edge in your graph gamma, then the contribution will vanish, and you'll only get contribution from the stable graph with no edges the one corresponding to smooth curves. Okay, so I want to talk about some example, say a very simple graph. I have um, two vertices, maybe I have leg one here and leg two here. So that's going to be the gamma, what I've drawn so far. And then in order to describe a term here, I also need to choose some number of virtual legs to add to this graph for each kappa, for each k. So let's say that, I don't know, maybe I have two, two legs here, which I'll draw by dotted lines. One leg here. So KV is two there, KV is one there. And these virtual legs, they don't have labels on them or anything. I mean, I could write like labels NV plus one, NV plus two on here, and NV plus one on this leg, but now I, I want to, so this is the basic situation. I have over here, this vertex corresponds to some GV, NV plus KV. In this case, NV is two and KV is also two. So now I need to write insertions everywhere. So let's start by on the legs that we start with. So here we want to at some point incorporate the data of the V1 through VN that we started with. So going to do so just by writing, let's write it over here, R inverse evaluated at psi times V1, the contribution on that leg. Similarly over here, we'll have R inverse of psi V2, label two, label one. So the way you should think about this is that V1 is an element of the um, vector space V of your cohomological field theory. And 
our inverse of psi is some um, um, endomorphism of V which co with coefficients which are power series in psi. And multiplying then gives some, um, some element of V tensor formal power series in psi. So the thing that I'm putting here is really, you should think about this as being in say Q, well, let's just say in V tensor formal power series in psi. And that's going to be one of the factors that I put in here. And you might ask why are there psi's showing up here? And the idea is I'm extending the cohomological field theory sort of linearly in powers of psi in some sense. Yeah, so here I'm at a single leg, so I take that psi there. I could give it a name if I wanted, but I'll, I'll have psi's appearing everywhere. Basically, this formal variable z will, will be replaced by psi, and I just have to tell you where to use in, in r, and I just have to tell you where to insert r. So at each half edge in this picture, both these five legs here and the two sides of this leg, I'm going to tell you some vector in the space V weighted by power series in psi. Then I feed all of those in here. I apply the cohomological field theory, get a class, and then multiply it by the remaining powers of psi. Get something which I then apply these other operations to. Okay, so that, that's what the actual legs are. Then there are these sort of virtual legs, kappa legs, sometimes they're called. So there, I want to put something which I don't have any V sub i's to use. Instead, each one of these, I want to put something like psi times one minus R inverse of psi. That's some matrix applied to the vector, well, the unit vector. And I put the same thing over here. Except that I'm using a different psi on that leg, of course. And the same thing on this third log. Then along the edge, this is the most complicated part. On, along the edge, I want to come up with a bivector so that I can feed one element of vector space V to the left and one element to the right. So I'm going to write a bivector here previously using this bivector, which is the inverse of the metric, A to inverse, and take that and subtract off, I'll take our inverse of psi acting on the left side of eta and also acting on the right side of eta. Transpose there, and acting on the right side of the bivector. Again, eta inverse is in V tensor V. So I take that and then I divide by, sorry, this should be psi prime, divide by psi plus psi prime. So here I have two psi classes, one for each side of the edge. One psi class really lives in, in this case I have like MGV comma four on that vertex. Other one is an MGV prime comma three. I have the psi classes along this edge in both sides, psi and psi prime. So you might be a little concerned that I'm dividing by psi plus psi prime here. It turns out that the divisibility of the numerator by the denominator just as formal series in, in um, I guess, V tensor, V tensor, um, power series in psi and psi prime, this, this formal divisibility is essentially equivalent to the symplectic property, or at least it's implied. Sorry? There, 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 there is no star, but there is a transpose here. I mean, this is a little different because I'm really I'm acting on just, transpose means I'm acting on the right V instead of the left V. But I'm acting in the same way. I mean, I 
I mean, I, I, I think it will be equivalent to what you want to do, and it's just different notation. This is maybe a little clearer what this means, but comparing it with what's over there might be harder, yes. Okay, so I, I've now told you factors to put along every half edge, which again will in general be vectors in my vector space weighted by power series in whatever psi is at that location. And then at the vertices, I, I feed these inputs to the omega gv nv plus kv. So this is all the, all the stuff going on in the definition of the R matrix action. Um, I mean, more or less, you have, I mean, there's, there's this weird thing going on with these virtual legs, which I'm then removing by the push forward map, by this one over k factorial pi star, where pi is forgetting about those k points. Those are the dotted legs here. Um, Purpose of that is is actually so you might notice that that's the one place where the unit shows up in this definition. Um, the insertions that I do along the um, virtual legs, and that's because the purpose of the virtual legs is basically to preserve the unit. Um, you can define the R matrix action without the virtual legs, and it won't preserve the unit, but will preserve all the other structures. For the rest of what's going on. Um, these are more or less the most natural choices for um, inserting vectors that you can come up with if you want to twist by the matrix R. I mean, so now if we think about what happens when R is just one, the identity, this should be the trivial action. Indeed, R doesn't change V1, so you just have V1 applying there. Um, these virtual leg contributions are zero, so you don't have to worry about them. You can assume that KV is zero everywhere because these virtual contributions vanish and the edge vanishes also since you have eta inverse minus eta inverse on the numerator. So that, that at least should convince you that, and, and so you're, you're left with just a sum over a single graph, no edges, corresponding to the um, generic boundary stratum, I guess. And in that, you have one term, which is just omega gn itself, evaluated at v1 through vn. So that, that should at least convince you that um, the action of the identity matrix is trivial. The fact that this is a group action is quite a lot to check. I mean, the fact, I mean, there are many things that could be checked here. You can check that this takes cohomological field theories to cohomological field theories. Um, and you can check that this is actually so that requires checking the three axioms I wrote down previously. Um, and you can also check that this is a group action of this group of matrices, sometimes called the symplectic loop group. And I should note that, again, in this formula, R itself doesn't appear, only R inverse appears, which might look a little silly. And that, that's just so it will be a left action instead of a right action, the, the usual thing. That, so that, that, that's solely for that purpose. Okay, so this is a long definition, but I mean, the result in practice is that if you have an explicit cohomological field theory that you start with, and you want to compute the action on it by a specific R matrix, then you end up with some sum over graphs. And the various factors that you put in here you get certain um, psi factors coming from the matrix R, and although it might be less clear, these virtual legs are more or less contributing kappas. So you're getting sort of um, arbitrary tautological classes showing up. I, I should mention that in this definition, I'm only using like gluing maps and psi classes and push forward maps by um, forgetful, I'm using all these, these tautological constructions. So it should be clear from this definition that if I start with a cohomological field theory, which takes values in tautological cohomology, then I apply some R matrix to it, it will still be tautological. All right, any questions about R matrix action?
So maybe I will restate now the theorem that I said at the end last time of Telemann, of given Tull's reconstruction conjecture. So theorem Telemann. And previously I said that wrote it as in the, in, in the form of any cohomological field theory as the R matrix action acts freely and transitively on the um, set of cohomological field theories with a fixed V eta one and quantum multiplication on V. Maybe I'll state it in a um, equivalent way is that any semi-simple homological field theory omega can be uniquely written in the form omega equals r times lowercase omega, or applied to lowercase omega, um, for some you know, oh right, for some R in the symplectic loop group I guess depending on your definitions, it might be only part of the symplectic loop group, this group of matrices. And some topological field theory lowercase omega. Remember, topological field theory is just a cohomological field theory which only takes values in cohomological degree one. So you just have numbers. So this is equivalent to the same end I gave yesterday. I think I briefly said that, that it was equivalent to this. I mean, it means this, this symplectic condition here on power series. What? The R of Z times R. Yeah, this. All, all, all I know is that sometimes people call this uh, R, uh, call this condition saying that R is in the symplectic loop group, and sometimes it's that R is in some piece of the symplectic loop group. Maybe I shouldn't use the terminology if I'm not sure exactly what the symplectic loop group is, but I mean that condition. So where do I need it? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned out loud, you, you, you should worry a bit that I'm inverting psi plus psi prime here because if I want to end up with power series and psi and psi prime to feed to the two sides, I shouldn't be dividing by psi plus psi prime. And the symplectic condition is basically equivalent to the statement that the numerator is divisible by the denominator here. Yes, and that, that's, I mean, it's going to be symmetric again by how I'm thinking about this transpose. Like, eta inverse is some bivector, which is symmetric by definition, because I started with a symmetric by a linear form. Eta inverse is symmetric element of V tensor V, and then I'm really just, this is some element of endomorphisms of V. I'm applying it to either side, so it will stay symmetric. Sorry, this is psi prime here. Maybe that's not. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, when I write this down here, I mean the first factor V is the left, the right side. First side is psi and the second side is psi prime. Oh, 
All right, so by this theorem of Telemann, we know that any semi-simple cohomological field theory really is of this form. It's of this form where this inner cohomological field theory is not an extra cohomology class. Like in general, if you apply given Tulsa R matrix action some cohomological field theory, and you have the sum over graphs, but then the, then you also have the sort of arbitrary tautological classes on the inside in this omega. But in the case where you're applying R matrix action to topological field theory, this is just a number. And in that case, you really have that this is an expression of the type I've talked about before for a topological class, writing it as a sum of basic classes. Push forward of under gluing map corresponding some graph. And in the case where omega is just topological field theory, this entire thing in here will just be polynomial in the kappa classes and psi classes. So this is a powerful theorem that basically says that, again, if, if, if you have some topological class you're interested in that belongs to cohomological field theory, then there's a sum R matrix which will give you a formula for it of this form as a sum over graphs written explicitly as a sum of basic tautological classes, these additive generators for the tautological ring. In particular, and I say this out loud last time, but maybe I'll just state it out loud again, because I don't really need it, but corollary is a semi-simple cohomological field theory takes tautological values, at least in, in cohomology. Okay, so that's given Tulsa matrix action. Now I want to move back towards relations. So I'm going to write down a, I'm going to describe to you a cohomological field theory in this form. I'm going to tell you a topological field theory. I'm going to tell you an R matrix. And then by using this action, that will determine some more complicated cohomological field theory given by R times lowercase omega. So, by telling you, giving you a description of a specific um, topological field theory, I'll just call it lowercase omega. That's why I've been calling all my topological field theories. So, to tell you what this is, I need to tell you. Well, first, all the basic data of what I should have a vector space. The vector space will be two dimensional. Let's give it a basis. It's QE0 plus QE1. Two generators. I need a metric. Data will be the anti diagonal metric in this basis. I need a specific element, the unit element, that will be zero, the first basis element. And then I need to tell you what omega gn of arbitrary inputs are. I'm going to, because again, cohomological field theories are symmetric, I just have to tell you what it is evaluated at E0 with N0 copies, tensor E1 with N1 copies. So N0 plus N1 equals that. I want this to be equal to either 2 to the G if G plus N1 is odd, 0 else. So again, I'm just, I have a number for every G and N because it's a topological filter. I don't need to talk about cohomology. In order to check this as a topological field theory, rather check it's a cohomological field theory, I, need to, I would need to check those three axioms. Well, it, it's symmetric by definition. It's symmetric on this basis. I just care about how many E0s and how many E1s I have. And so I just need to check that the, it behaves well under pullback by gluing and um, forgetful maps. 
And, and this, is, this is straightforward to do. Basically what's happening is, well, first of all, pulling back by forgetful maps sh should be the same as putting an extra copy of E0 in. And however many copies of E0 I have doesn't affect the value here. Of course, pulling back by any of these maps, so these are just numbers. Pullback doesn't change the degree of a, of a um, number. So pulling back by forgetful maps is fine because E0 is a unit. Pulling back by gluing maps is a little bit more interesting. Basically what's going on is that you start out with some E0s, E1s, and then you want to pull back to some boundary divisor, and so you have still your N, E0, and E1s on the two sides here. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, something like that. You have some genus here. One G two. So I mean that that's just the data of which gluing map I've chosen. And these are the original E0 and E1 inputs that I had before taking a pullback by this gluing map. And now remember that the way that pulling back is supposed to work is that I insert the bivector given by the inverse of that. So that bivector means I either put zero one or I put one zero. I have those two options. I put something different on the two sides because I have the anti-diagonal metric. And then I'm supposed to sum up those two values of omega gn of here times omega gn of there for each of the two options. I'm supposed to get omega gn of the thing I started with. And the reason why this works is that g1 plus g2 equals g, and exactly one of these choices will have this parity constraint be satisfied. There's something similar for the self-nodal case, g minus one, except here what the situation will be that the genus went down by one, but both possible ways, either zero, one, or one, zero, will maintain the parity constraint. That's just very, very, very quickly explaining what you need to check that this is a homological field theory. Um, Yeah, I mean, it, more or less, you can. It, what you want to do is you want to choose some, and basically you want to change basis in V to some orthonormal basis for the, um, for some, 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 some basis that, that works well with the quantum multiplication. And once you do that, the um, formula becomes light. There's some general rule that one can write down. I mean, one can classify topological field theories in terms of. I mean, I mean, you have to tell tell me what all of these things are, but. Sure. I mean, it's not even a collection of matrices. It's a collection of numbers indexed by tuples. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 it is not a hard check. Um, okay, so I want to take that topological field theory in this two-dimensional vector space, and I'm also going to take an R matrix. We'll take R. So remember, R should be a two by two matrix now with entries which are power series in a single variable Z. And I'm going to write it in terms of these hypergeometric series A and B. Where is this? I'll leave the picture up there, which is really the content of how our matrix action works, but. Actually. Right up here. So remember that we had, in defining the FC relations, we had hypergeometric series A equals summation 6n factorial for 3n factorial, 2n factorial, 
t to the n and b is something similar. I want to write down a two by two matrix R now using those. Rather using the odd and even parts of A and B. So let me make sure I have the signs. Okay. So I want to put negative even of Z um, odd of Z negative A odd of Z and a even. Okay. So hopefully you hear what I mean even and odd just mean I take the even powers of t or the odd powers of t and then I replace t by what I'm choosing to call my formal variable here, z. So this is a matrix. Um, you can check that it has leading term identity matrix because a um, I mean, it clearly has diagonal leading term because uh, in Z, because odd, odd parts means you don't have constant terms off the diagonal. A had um, leading term one, B had leading term minus one as I defined it. So this is actually going to be as a matrix value, as a power series with matrix coefficients, the, the constant coefficient is side empty matrix as it should be, and then the Symplectic condition is, you can check, it's equivalent to a sort of nice little identity between the A and B series. Maybe I'll actually write what B is. 6n plus 1 divided by 6n minus 1, 6n factorial, 3n factorial, 2n factorial. Symplectic condition, if you multiply this by its adjoint with respect to anti-diagonal, then you get the condition you need is equivalent to A of T times B of minus T plus A of minus T plus B of T equals negative two. times here, of course. A somewhat fun identity between hypergeometric series to prove. Okay. Um, yes. I mean, I, I really mean the symplectic condition is equivalent to this four matrices of this form. Yes. Okay, so I, I've now told you an R matrix and I've told you a topological field theory. I now have the R matrix action. It defines a more complicated cohomological field theory than this topological field theory. So now, if you look at given tools, our matrix action, think about applying this to it. I mean, it's obviously complicated exactly what's going on, but you end up with some sum over stable graphs where for each graph, you take a product of lots of local factors involving taking these A and B series and inserting them in, in various places as powers of psi classes and stuff. Should start to look similar to the um, FZ relations I wrote down. So, theorem, work of Pantar Bondo, Zvonkin. Um, I should say that our proof worked in cohomology. Later, Felix Yonda proved this in Chow. Again, you can have Chow, Chow ring valued theories if you want and define the R matrix action the same way. 
um, applying this R matrix, this topological field theory, de defines a, a, a chow value theory if you want. What does the theorem say? It says if I take that R matrix and that topological field theory, combine them together, I get a cohomological field theory, evaluate it somewhere, let's say at ease. N0 copies of E0 and N1 copies of E1, then the theorem is that this vanishes in degree, cohomological degree, D vanishes in H star of mg n bar in degree d for all d strictly greater than g minus 1 plus n sub 1 divided by 3. So pick g, pick n, 0 and, and 1 summing to n pick D greater than this number, then take this, this data together, combine it using this picture here to get some, some overall stable graphs of these topological classes given by these series, take the degree D part, and the thing you get a, a tautological relation. Yes, I, I, I will briefly sketch the proof, yes. So, I'll just write in parentheses, so this gives non-trivial tautological relations because saying that these vanish, and they certainly don't formally vanish if you write this out. And this is slightly a lie, because if you look very closely at this, you can see that there might be some sort of parity constraint lurking here, which again shouldn't be surprised from the FC relation. Since you have this anti-diagonal matrix, your matrix R has this even and odd thing going on. Combine them together, you still have some parity thing, which means that actually half of these um, vanish formally without giving relations. But the other half give non-trivial topological relations. Okay, so let's sketch the proof. Sketch of proof. So there's the geometric input, and that's the, just say, the existence of and properties of Witten's three spin class. It is rather technical to define. It was first defined by. Polish talk. Later by um, Kyoto and, and various other people, Van Jarvis, Ron, analytically, for instance. And so, what, what do I need about this class? I need that after a shifted version of it. Say a shifted version of the three spin class forms a cohomological field theory, which we'll call W three. 
with the following properties, the very special homological field there, right? So properties are that W3 has um, degree zero part equal to the omega that I previously defined, that topological field there, right? And W, 3GN, if I evaluate this again at E0 to the N0 times E1 to the N1, then this should be equal to all of these things are up to some scalar constant factors, by the way. I think for this to be correct, I have to multiply by 1728 to the N or something like that, given how I define things. Um, but I guess this part will be fine, but. Witten's three spin class, which is of pure cohomological degree equal to the numbers I wrote over there, g minus one plus n one divided by three plus lower degree terms. The lower degree terms are due to this shift that I haven't told you about. But it's in cohomological, it, the top degree piece is, is of this pure degree. It's equal to Witten's three spin class above there. This cohomological field theory vanishes. And now from this theorem, you can guess what the um, final property is that I need, which is that, in fact, W three is equal to up to some factors of 1728 maybe, equal to R applied to omega, but the R and omega of that theorem. So how do we know this? So this is where the A and B series actually come up. We know this because of the second part of Telemann's theorem I didn't write down, which tells under certain circumstances how to explicitly determine the R matrix. And so here this comes from R matrix is obtained by solving a fairly simple, I'm not going to write it down here, differential equation coming from there are a couple of equivalent things I could say coming from some additional structure on this topological field theory and Euler field. It comes from homogeneous calibration of the corresponding for Benius manifold. Um, I don't want to get bogged down the details, but the idea is just there is some um, additional sort of numerical invariance of Wynn's three spin class related to the fact that it was of pure cohomological degree before I shifted it, which give rise to some straightforward differential equation that lets you compute the R matrix recursively degree by degree. And when you do that, you get these six n factorial by, by three n factorial, two n factorial. So really, in this case, the A and the B series are seen as basic invariants of some Frobenius manifold corresponding to um, to this three spin class. So, 
Yeah, so you can, you can do this in general if you replace 3 by R. So there is a differential equation that it always satisfies. However, that differential equation doesn't have unique solutions. If you also additionally have some Euler field or homogeneity condition, then there is in, in general differential equation that determines R uniquely. So in practice, if you want to know the R matrix, there, you don't always need an Euler field or homogeneity constraint, but in this case, in this case, that's the appropriate method to use to determine the R matrix. Like the theorem is that there's always unique R matrix. Determining the R matrix might be hard in general, but in this case, there's some differential equation that we have. And yeah, there's some, some such equation in general. All right, so Give all logical relations. I've told you that they are related to the FC relations. Um, you might wonder about exactly how they're related. Um, this G over three looks familiar, but the, F, the FC relations had this um, parameter, which was a partition, which isn't which isn't really visible here. So that, that concludes the sketch of the proof. And you just combine the fact that this cohomological field theory vanishes above a certain dimension by um, geometric reasons with the fact that we have an explicit formula for it to get these relations. We'll erase this now. So let's let R of G and D be the relation in R star of MGN bar, really, I guess, in RD of MGN bar, given by degree D part of what is written over there where I'm just using E1. So I take R applied to omega GN evaluated at E1 and copies of that and take the degree D part. So I'll state a conjecture about the full structure of teleological ring of MGN bar in two, in two ways. The first way, the conjecture um, all relations in R star of MGN bar can be obtained. from the RGN um, and pullback slash push forward by gluing and forgetful maps. What I mean by that is on MGN bar, you have all these maps between the spaces. If you have a tautological relation in one location, then you can take the pullback of an or forgetful map. That's a new one. Maybe you multiply it by some psi classes, then it's still a tautological relation. You push it forward, then you glue it to some arbitrary other class. It's still a tautological relation. You have all these transformations that you can do to take tautological relations to tautological relations. This conjecture is saying that if you take all such ways of moving the, this small list of relations around, Again, there's, there's some constraint here, which is that um, D should be greater than um, G minus one plus N over three for the statue of a relation. If you take all of those relations, move them around by the 
basic maps and you multiply them some things all possible ways and this is saying that you, the conjecture is that this generates all the relations in tautological ring from GN bar. So let me now write that a little bit more explicitly which should start to make it clear what the relationship is with the FZ relations in terms of where does that partition show up in all this. So be very explicit about which of those um, push forward pullback maps you, you need to use. So conjecture, and it's a proposition these two conjectures are equivalent. So again, I want to say it as any relation in R star of MGN bar is a linear combination of relations of the following form. So I start with one of these RGND relations. I then pull it back by a forgetful map. Pulling back by a forgetful map, you might remember from cohomological field theory axioms, the same thing as adding inputs, which are the unit. The unit was E0, so this is just adding back in the E0s, which I left out in this definition. All this, I don't know, pi two, pi, there will also be a pi one. Um, now I want to take that and multiply it by a psi monomial. Still tautological relation. Now I want to take all of that and I want to push it forward by some pi one star. Yeah, so pi 1, pi 2 are forgetful maps. Maybe forgetting multiple points. So for instance, pi 2 is from, and these are all going to, pi 1, pi 2 will both be from m, g, say m, g, k to m, g, k minus k prime or something like that. They're both forgetful maps of that form. So I've pulled back by forgetful map multiplied by some, you know, say, psi monomial. Now I push forward by some other set of points. Now I want to take all of this I'm going to take the push forward by a arbitrary gluing map where this is on one factor and then the other factors I'm pushing forward corresponding to other vertices of gamma are just arbitrary um, psi kappa monomials. Iota gamma is a gluing map. So, and these are clearly operations I can do and still have a tautological relation at the end. I'm saying that these are all operations I need to do conjecturally. And if you don't do this final pushing forward to a boundary stratum, and instead, so then you leave out that part of this construction, then you restrict the interior to MGN, then you get precisely the FZ relations generalized as I explained before to MGN. And the way in which the partitions come up is by exactly which monomial in the psi class you're multiplying by and which points you're adding and forgetting. Okay, I am out of time, so I will stop there. This conjecturally gives description to a logical ring of MGN bar. As with the um, FC relations on MG, 
In small cases, we can check that these are all such relations because they give a Gorenstein ring. This will always be the case though, since we know this ring is never a Gorenstein, but these, these are still all the relations that we know how to construct. All the special relations that have been constructed in the past, like Getzer's relation, R2M14 bar, are special cases here where you choose appropriate GND and maybe move it around a little. 